Almost everyone in the United States at one time or another has traveled at least a stretch of old Route 66. It's um, the road where the people from Oklahoma went to California. It's a part of American history. Just the name conjures up images of going somewhere. To me, it's going back in, in, back in time, seeing things that I grew up with. So let's travel this blue highway all the way from Chicago to Santa Monica. Hello, and welcome to Blue Highways TV, traveling Route 66. Blue Highways, those secondary roads that have been replaced by the four-lane super slab interstates, have literally become America's link to the past. And while the interstates all look and feel the same, Blue Highways are constantly changing, and Route 66 is no exception. During my earlier trips down the Mother Road, the chain of rocks bridge that once carried Route 66 over the mighty Mississippi was closed and abandoned. And St. Louis's classic no-tell motel, the Coral Court, was still going strong. In 2001, as the Mother Road turned 75, things had definitely changed. The bridge was reborn into a pedestrian trail, but the Coral Court was another story. When we were here in 94, the popular landmark was already closed and slated for the wrecking ball. Sadly, the Art Deco Motor Court has now been replaced by a condominium complex. But at least Shelley Graham has captured its spirit in photos and stories from the lost Route 66 landmark in her book, Tales from the Coral Court. I first saw Coral Court and I was fascinated by it. I just saw it and I said, wow, it's so beautiful and authentic and deco. And it was eight and a half acres of these little uh, glazed brick and glass block bungalows. And it was just a time capsule of 1940. And I thought, how wonderful that this motor court had managed to survive. Thank goodness the Museum of Transport did save one complete unit. And that slice of Missouri's original no-tell motel is now on display at the Museum of Transportation outside St. Louis. Driving west in Missouri, the old highway once crossed the scenic Merrimack River at Times Beach, where in 1970, a dangerous herbicide was mistakenly sprayed on the town. Times Beach shriveled up, and the bridge was closed for nearly 30 years. Today, the blunder has been remedied. An old 66 bridge is open once again, beckoning walkers, bikers, and horseback riders into what remains of Times Beach, the new Route 66 State Park. The Bridgehead Inn, a favorite restaurant at the eastern approach to the bridge, is now the park's visitor center. When we first took that short detour off the Mother Road to film one of Missouri's first tourist attractions, Miramac Caverns was in the capable hands of Les Torelli, the grandson of its founder, Lester Dill. i never forget he used to tell me, him and my grandmother both, that uh, when people come into your establishment, you, you have to treat them like they were coming into your home and just treat them like family and make them welcome and make them want to come back. And that's what we try to do here. And so far it's worked. Now, Les is teaching his son the ropes of managing a commercialized cave. And he understands the lure of Route 66. The lure of Route 66 is the nostalgia and all the beautiful history that has surrounded the, the Mother Road. And Merrimack Caverns um, supports all that history and has some great history of its own. Happy 75th anniversary, Route 66. Happy 75th anniversary, Route 66. Aside from gas pumps, motels, and greasy spoons, I can't think of anything more closely associated with Route 66, or anything more uniquely American, for that matter, than the drive-in movie theater. During their heyday in the late 1950s, there were about 5,000 drive-ins all across America. Someone once counted more than 65 on the shoulders of Route 66 alone. But changing tastes, real estate prices, 
and air conditioning sealed the fates of many drive-ins. And by the 1980s, most had been converted into auto salvage yards, shopping malls, or housing developments. Most, but not all. Many, like the teepee outside Sepulpa, Oklahoma, have been closed, but left standing in the hope that someday their allure would return. So for years they stood, surviving only on memories of the good old days. But while there's no evidence that the teepee will ever open on April 15th, not far away at the Admiral Twin in Tulsa, new owners are sprucing up the place. The drive-ins that are still surviving probably have a chance to be around a while. Prices are five, you know, way cheaper than uh, first uh, than uh, the indoors. I think people remember when they came as as a kid, and it's something unique that they can bring their kids to or their grandchildren to. And it's not just happening in Tulsa. At the 66 drive-in in Carthage, Missouri, it's become a family operation since the owners rebuilt this old auto salvage yard. It was closed in 85, and uh, it was turned into a salvage yard. The, a lot of the drive-ins were turned into salvage yards because they was gravel areas and pretty clean. It made a good place for them to put the cars and, and part them out. We started restoring this, and we had a lot of car parts that, that were laying around. The screen hadn't had any maintenance on it in about uh, 12 or 13 years. But by 1997, they were playing movies again. We don't show any R-rated movies. We're geared towards the family. We just show uh, PG and G and PG-13 movies. A lot of people come out here because when you go to the inside movie, you can't smoke. Out here, you can smoke. Sadly, the future is not so certain for the 66 twin out in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Judging from the short lines at Morgan McCampson's ticket booth, it may not stay open for long. When we made our trip down America's Main Street in 1994, we counted only three drive-ins still showing movies. Now, there are at least six. An encouraging sign for a whole generation who has never attended a drive-in movie. And for those of us who cherish the days when we did. People that come through here uh, make a lot more of a deal over Route 66, and actually the people that live on it like we do. Uh, even in, in uh, European countries, you know, we have people come over here and ride motorcycles on tour and stop in to drive in. See, I think it kind of takes them back in time as, as far as seeing some of the old buildings and things were still along the route. Uh, and a lot of them are being refurbished like we did the drive in. And uh, I just think they like to see things the way they used to be. Little has changed in Kansas since we first brought our cameras here. Howard Litch, the man responsible for Galena's remarkable town museum, has passed away. But the rough and tumble mining town has changed little. Neither have Baxter Springs or Riverton. At Eisler Brothers Country Store in Riverton, Scott Nelson still prunes the plants just as he has since junior high school. We have a lot of people that travel Route 66 that are on their honeymoon or maybe their 66th birthday, or they're traveling on their wedding anniversary, or they're just researching the road. I've been traveling Route 66 just about all of my life. As a matter of fact, I was born just off an alignment of the old highway in St. Louis. So I consider myself a die-hard road warrior, a son of the mother road. And there are also those who spend their whole lives researching blue highways, like Route 66, their history, the different alignments they took over the years, and the people who lived along their shoulders. And when it comes to researching Route 66, we owe much of what we know about the historic highway to seasoned road warriors like Jim Ross. My specific focus, I guess you would say, in this road is in the construction evolution of the road, um, the mapping, uh, accounting for all the different alignments of the highway through the years. With artist Jerry McClanahan, Jim has traveled far and wide to document America's Main Street for videos, maps, and guidebooks. Together, Jim and Jerry have even unearthed some long-forgotten segments of old 66, the bones of the road. Jim takes his love of the old highway 
to what some people might consider an obsession. I got the idea from the house uh, about three years ago when I was looking for property on Route 66 and uh, uh, I was fortunate to find this, this piece of land and I wanted a house with a lot of character and something that would kind of fit into the Route 66 experience. And I had always uh, been a big fan of the, uh, the little Phillips 66 cottage style station uh, just up the road in Chandler. And so I incorporated uh, the facade from the front of the station onto the house. Jim is continually updating his map series and helping focus attention on the history of 66. Yet, with each passing year, the highway changes. The bridge that used to carry old 66 into Baxter Springs was once covered in graffiti. But it's much spiffier these days. A newer span was built nearby, so the original concrete arches have now attained landmark status. Traveling west beyond the Oklahoma border, Ed Galloway's Totem Pole Park near Foyle has also been resurrected. This is the only remaining folk art of its kind left in Oklahoma. There are 200 different carved pictures on this pole alone. The four Indian chiefs on top are nine feet tall, making Ed Galloway's message loud and clear. There was someone here before us. Beyond the highway city of Claremore, another Oklahoma 66 icon has been given a new lease on life. When we filmed here before, the famous blue whale was getting a little long in the tooth. While nobody is yet clamoring to dive in and take a dip at the once popular swimming hole, at least the whale has a new coat of paint to show off and make that smile seem wider. Not so next door at the former animal reptile kingdom. In 94, we could make out the arc design of the weathering gift shop. Today, it is overgrown and unrecognizable. Across Highway 66 at the old Arrowwood trading post, it was vibrant and busy back then. Today, in spite of the sign, no goods have been traded here in quite a few years. It's now a car repair shop. Down the road, beyond Tulsa, near Sepulpa, the venerable orange-colored steel bridge that carried Route 66 out of town was closed when we last went by, and its classic brick roadway was being dismantled. By the time you pass this way, who knows what fate will have befallen this Mother Road landmark. When we first visited the famed Round Barn in Arcadia, the structure was nearing 100 years old and in bad need of repair. But thanks to a slew of volunteers spearheaded by the late Luke Robinson, it now looks as new as when it was built in 1898, and it's become one of the most visited Mother Road landmarks. In Oklahoma City, there is another landmark, not too distant from the shoulders of America's Main Street, one that wasn't there when we made our journey in 1994. It's a memorial none of us would have ever wanted. At 9.01 on the morning of April 19, 1995, things were normal at the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. By 9.03, 168 people had lost their lives here in the worst act of domestic terrorism ever recorded on American soil. Today, the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial stands where the federal building once did. 168 chairs fill a hillside, symbolic of those who died. The survivor's tree, which miraculously survived the blast, and the reflecting pools, all somber tributes to the worst single disaster to ever happen along Route 66. Remember the Big 8 Motel in El Reno, Oklahoma? This is where Hollywood came to make their blockbuster movie Rain Man. And for years after Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman checked in, Room 17, where they stayed, became quite a tourist attraction. The motel they were going to shoot in Amarillo, 
got uh, down on the sun sim, well, it was on the old 66 highway, and it got tore down. Somebody they sold it, and they tore it down before they got a contract on it. So that's coming through here with a picture of that one, and they run into Marinelle Clark, which is a friend of ours, head of the Tourism Bureau at that time, and uh, she showed, they showed her the picture, and they said, oh, I know where the one looked just like it. So they came out here and looked at it, and that was it. This bed was turned around where the head of it was at the window. Dustin Hoffman had something about his head being to a window. It had a green chair in this corner. We've had at least 3,000 people in here from Europe. There's usually eight or 10 a day that stops out there and takes pictures. But since 1994, the property has changed hands, and apparently the new owner is no movie buff. He's turned the distinctive Big 8 into the Deluxe Inn, just another nondescript motel along the Mother Road. But take heart, Route 66 collectors. Rumor has it the classic Big 8 sign, billing this as Amarillo's finest, is still around. In its heyday, Route 66 had no lack of diversity in the look of the hotels, motels, and motor courts that lined the shoulders. There were no cookie cutter chains. Back then, Route 66 mirrored the differences that were America. But more than architecture, what has fascinated me are the variety of famous people who have sought shelter along America's Main Street. It's common knowledge that Clark Gable and Carol Lombard married in Kingman, Arizona, and spent their wedding night in a room at the hotel in the mining town of Oatman. A lot of visitors believe that their ghosts are still there. In Gallup, New Mexico, the El Rancho was once a popular hotel playground for Hollywood's cowboy stars and starlets who traveled to the Southwest to film their movies around the nearby mesas. And I must say, I'm flattered to have a room named after me at the former Navajo Motel, now the Route 66 in Seligman, Arizona. You got to admit, I'm in pretty good company here. But of all the rooms rented by celebrities along the Mother Road, I'm most fascinated by the one at the Trade Winds in Clinton, Oklahoma. This room was favored by the king. And by the king, I mean Elvis. This is a room that Elvis Presley stayed in four different times. They had food service, and they came in around 11 o'clock or later at night, and they checked out early part of the afternoons. I think he liked the style of the room, the size of the room, and also the Canadian cedar, which makes a beautiful ceiling. And uh, the furnishings in this room are exactly the same as they were when Mr. Presley stayed here on different times. The, these lamps uh, that we're looking at are the original lamps. Elvis uh, was on his way from Memphis, his home to uh, Hollywood or Las Vegas, and he was a frequent visitor uh, until uh, his uh, identity was known, and uh, he never did return again. And now, for the mere cost of a night's rest, you can share the king's favorite accommodation. When I first got here, they told me it was Elvis Presley's room, and I went in, and it was so big, and it was very, very comfortable. It makes me wonder about what he actually did in that bed. <laughs> 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 no, but it, it was... Uh... The late Lucille Hammond's motel and service station near Hydro, Oklahoma, is still one of the road's most recognizable spots. No wonder Sandra Waters and Sherry Alsus agreed to be photographed there. They were on their pink trash tour of America, and French photographers wanted to immortalize their trip here at Lucille's. We've been on the road since April 3rd already. And we, start, we started out, we went down through lower Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and went back up and met some friends and went to a rally. And then we went to Santa Monica and started Route 66. Now we're headed for Chicago. We're just going everywhere and doing everything for six months on the motorcycles. Everybody knows Route 66. They don't know Route 99, they don't know, you know, but Route 66, it resonates. Happy 75th birthday, Route 66! On down the road beyond Weatherford in Clinton, 
A true Route 66 institution is gone. Pop Hicks Restaurant, for decades known far and wide as Clinton's unofficial town hall, burned to the ground on August 2nd, 1999. All that's left is an empty lot, the old foundation, some charred bricks, and memories of the good times. Not far from where Pop Hicks once stood, those memories and more are being preserved at two new museums that have recently opened in western Oklahoma. Visitors at the Oklahoma Route 66 Museum experience what the early days were like on the Mother Road. They just think it's a very wonderful place to visit. They feel like after they went through the museum, they have went back down memory lane. The diner era was just such a popular part of Route 66, and it's just such a bright room, the neon signs. In Elk City, an entire block has been set aside and made to look as it might have been back in the 1930s. The National Route 66 Museum takes the visitor on a nostalgic trip down the highway, state by state. You start in Chicago, and uh, in Illinois, and then you go through the eight different states till you come to, La uh, to California. I remember See, I had a business on 66. Now, we never thought anything about 66. It was just our road, and that was the road we traveled, and, you know, that was it. It wasn't until after the road was closed that it was became so famous, you know, to us. Once you enter the Lone Star State, the first town of any size is Shamrock. When we were here before, we stopped by the You Drop In for some chicken fried steak with Richard Smith, a local 66 booster. The You Drop has been closed for some time now, but this distinctive edifice is still a popular landmark in Texas. And we've got a grant to reopen it to sit. The First National Bank bought the building and donated to the city of Shamrock, and we've got a grant to rebuild it. We're going to put all the neon back on it. Uh, and put it, restore it back to its originality like it was built in 1936. Richard works hard to preserve Route 66 icons. His efforts pay off. These days, he and his grandson see a lot of tourists come through Shamrock. Well, most of them, when they come back here, they, they were all was, were kids coming through here, and their parents brought them through when it was the old route. Now they got into the senior group, and they're coming back to see what they didn't get to see in those old cars when Daddy brought them across here at 90 miles an hour and they rode in the back seat of the car and they just got to stop at the gas station. Since we visited Richard and the U Drop In in 2001, I'm happy to report that all the hard work has paid off. The popular Shamrock landmark has been refurbished and open once again, not as a cafe, but as a welcome center for eager Route 66 travelers. Until next time, I'm Michael Wallace. Travel well.